Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Alexis Dejarnet with Axiom Space. We're excited to share an update on the important microgravity research, experiments, technology demonstrations, and STEAM outreach that will occur during Axiom Space's AX2 mission, which is now targeted to launch the ISS no earlier than May 8th. To begin, we will hear brief remarks from Axiom Space's Director of In-Space Manufacturing and Chief Scientist and the Saudi Space Commission and some of the select principal investigators who are sending experiments and research on the AX2 mission. I'm excited to introduce today's speakers representing the over 20 different experiments that will be conducted on the ISS. To start off, let me introduce our Axiom Space team. We have Lucy Lowe, Chief Scientist, Janice Stoudemire, Director of In-Space Manufacturing. Now I would like to introduce our partners. We have Michelle Ash Memory, who is the Microgravity Research Lead for the Saudi Space Commission, Mary Ann Snow, CEO of Ascrab Biotech, Dr. Clive Svensson, Executive Director of the Regenerative Medicine Institute at Cedar Sinai, Dr. Kat Jamison, who is the Director of the Sanford Stem Cell Institute at UC San Diego, Dr. Anthony Atala, Director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and Deva Newman, who's the director of the MIT Media Lab. We look forward to this opportunity to focus on AX2 and to provide an overview of the important work that will be done on this historic second all-private mission to the International Space Station. In a moment, I will turn it over to our speakers and their opening remarks. Following the remarks, we'll open it up for reporters to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your questions in the chat to the moderator or use the raise your hand feature. When you are called upon, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question to. We'll begin with Lucy's opening remarks. Over to you, Lucy. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Alexis, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to tell you about some of the outstanding research that we have planned for the AX2 mission. So as you know, uh, AX2 is the second all-private crewed mission to the International Space Station. And Axiom Space is the commercial space industry's only full service orbital mission provider that is conducting full service end to end crewed missions for private astronauts, both private individuals and those representing global sovereign nations. We are privileged to partner with an ever expanding international space community to diversify the space industry, expand access to space and enable more nations, individuals, researchers and organizations to have access to work in microgravity than ever before. So a couple of fun facts for this historic AX2 mission. Um, Dr. Uh, commander Dr. Peggy Whitson will be the first female commander of a private space mission. We're tremendously excited that she is commanding this mission. This is the first mission with both private and professional government astronauts funded through a commercial arrangement. Uh, we will be welcoming the first Saudi astronauts to visit the International Space Station, and that includes Rayana Ranawi, who is the first Arab woman to fly to space, uh, and the first female astronaut from Saudi Arabia. So on to the research. So the AX2 mission will consist of more than 20 experiments uh, and projects, as Alexis referred to, that contribute to our knowledge of ourselves, our planet, and our universe beyond it. Our four crew members will conduct all of these different experiments while aboard the space station. Our astronauts train to NASA requirements and work closely with our research partners like the ISS National Lab to accomplish really meaningful science. I'd also like to point out that two of the crew on AX2 are trained biomedical research scientists. So everyone's research is in really good hands. Some of the research on AX2 that includes life sciences work will include groups of projects doing proof of concept studies for in-space manufacturing applications, which my colleague Jana will tell you all about. Projects looking at stem cells and tissue engineering for regenerative medicine, as well as looking at its immune dysfunction in cancer models that can help predict and prevent cancer amongst others. Our crew will participate in a number of human research studies that look at the effects of microgravity on the human body and brain and see how it adapts to space, as well as exploring some of the risks, uh, known risks for long term spaceflight, like changes seen in the eye or how to maintain biomechanical loading of muscles and joints by the wearing of special suits, which we'll learn more about during this press conference. Physical sciences projects include those looking at radiation shielding properties of special materials, 
as well as cloud seeding and storm cloud and lightning phenomena, which can help us understand Earth's weather and climate, as well as help us develop new agricultural methods for farming in resource poor areas. We have a bunch of Axiom projects that are going to be technology demonstrations, looking at uh, communications, inventory tracking and image processing, plus a project monitoring and also visualizing the cabin air to help keep crew healthy and safe in these really extreme and enclosed spaces in future. And finally, for science, technology, engineering, art and mathematics or STEAM projects, in addition to the exciting art competition that our pilot John Schofner is leading while he's on board, our crew will also do a number of ham radio events and some really fun experiments that children on Earth can see and replicate to compare between the conditions seen in space and on Earth that will look at liquid interactions in a very colorful, colorful manner, aerodynamics at looking at how kites fly in space, and also looking at thermal transfer differences in space versus on Earth to help them understand some basic physical properties. So with that, I'll end and hand back to Alexis. Thank you so much, Lucy. And over to you, Jenna, for your opening remarks. Thanks, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today to hear more about the AX2 mission. This is a historic moment for us, not only in human spaceflight and how we prepare for the future of living and working in space, but on this first mission, AX2 mission, we will have our first in-space manufacturing demonstration. So it's a very exciting time for us. We're really at an inflection point where access, capabilities, and infrastructure are taking shape to really create the future of people living and working in space. With our first module um, being attached to the ISS in 2025, it's exciting to think that this is happening right now. I know that a lot of people, when they think about living and working in space, think about that as something that's gonna happen in the future. And the truth is it's very near term. In addition to the access for private citizens and countries that Axiom Station provides, really the infrastructure that is being created is the first opportunity to have the required physical space and state-of-the-art capabilities that allow manufacturing in low earth orbit. What we've learned in the last two decades is not just about operating a space station and living in space, but about science and the impact of microgravity on biological and physical systems. On the AX2 mission, we're actually setting the cornerstone for the foundation of new markets in low Earth orbit. The satellite economy has produced a robust commercial space economy, but it uses low Earth orbit as a vantage point for Earth observation and for communications. And what we're really doing is opening the door to new segments that actually help us to create improved products by leveraging what we know about how biological and physical science changes in that microgravity environment. We're producing products on orbit that can't be produced here on Earth. So we've taken the basic research that's been done and turned that into applied research that helps us to create novel compounds and products that are like nothing that we can create with gravity here on Earth. You'll hear more today about the payloads that will be part of the AX2 mission and our, our first steps in developing the future in-space manufacturing applications and models that can help us to predict and prevent cancer from our visionary partners who we're working with to build history. Very pleased to be here and look forward to hearing from all of the participants. Thank you, Jana. We will now hear from Michelle Ashmemory from the Saudi Space Commission. Over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me. We are very delighted to be here and to participate uh, on the AX2 mission, as it is our inaugural mission for our human spaceflight program. The human spaceflight program was introduced by the Saudi Space Commission as a sustainable program under the leadership of His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman with the efforts to uh, contribute globally and to have impactful science around the world that benefits all humanity. On this particular mission, we are very excited because we uh, engaged local scientists to, to develop experiments that are novel and impactful capitalizing on this short stay mission to understand better the human body, cell science, as well as yeah, thinking about artificial rain. With regards to the um, human research that we're doing, we have six experiments conducted by Nebula R&D. Essentially, those are focused on uh, blood-based biomarkers, as an example, to see how the effects of short-stay missions have on uh, 
essentially these biomarkers, uh, which will inform in for future missions for tourists. So not everybody that goes to space is going to have go through the critical path for an astronaut. There will be space tourists. And to understand the effects of short stay missions on the human body, regardless of the level of uh, fitness of that person is critical. Uh, in addition, uh, our Nebula R&D is also looking at alterations in the telomeres, the telomere length during this short stay. There was also other experiments focused on measuring, uh, using a pupillometer to measure the intracranial pressure, uh, as well as using an EEG for the first time to measure electrical brain activity while in space, as well as using an ultrasound to uh, essentially uh, measure the diameter of the optic uh, nerve sheath and see what the effects pre or um, pre the flight and then post the flight and then during the flight as well. And then there will be uh, another experiment, the sixth experiment from Nebula R&D is focused on cerebral perfusion and alterations in the brain uh, position in microgravity. These will help inform how the human body reacts in the microgravity environment and will give more data with regards to the short stay mission. Uh, on, uh, in addition to these experiments, as I mentioned, there is a cell science experiment. It's conducted by the world-renowned King Faisal Specialist Hospital Research Center under the leadership of uh, Dr. Khalid Ab uh, Abu Khabar, as well as Dr. Wijdan Al Ahmadi and Edward Hitley. They are investigating the inflammatory response of the human immune cell in microgravity. More specifically, their research will focus on changes in the mRNA decay and the process that which can turn off inflammation. They're focusing on four investigations within uh, this subject matter. Um, then we have uh, this really interesting experiment in which we're trying to understand how can we cloud seed or generate rain in microgravity. This will help inform uh, how we can create artificial rain for lunar and Martian settlements. Could we potentially produce rain such that we enable uh, essentially agriculture on the moon and Mars? Uh, this experiment is uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Ashraf. Farhat from, King, um, from uh, KFUPM, a university well-known in Saudi Arabia. Then we have really exciting uh, three outreach uh, opportunities and experiments. These outreach experiments are focused on essentially fluid uh, dynamics through uh, essentially it's called a liquid fireworks experiment. Kids are going to be able to do this experiment and in real time, the astronauts will do it on the ISS. They will juxtapose the results they get on the ground to the ones that are done in space, helping plant the seed of curiosity, as well as getting them engaged with this mission. In addition to that, we have another outreach experiment called the Space Kite, where kids are going to conduct the same experiment again on the ground and compare it to what the astronauts will do live in while they're on their ISS mission. And where, what they're going to do there is try to understand aerodynamics uh, inside the ISS and how it compares uh, because it's in microgravity to the to what we see uh, and the behavior of the kites on the ground. And the third experiment for outreach uh, essentially is one of my favorites, which is a heat transfer experiment. The idea there is to kind of expose kids to understand that the environment has a very impactful, uh, uh, it's very impactful towards the results of your experiment. So on Earth, we have conduction, convection and radiation. But in space, when we create spacecraft, you can only have radiation. So how do you start planning ahead for those kinds of missions? The cool thing about the outreach program, it's going to be disseminated uh, through 47 different locations in Saudi in collaboration with the Ministry of Education, MISC schools, Riyadh schools, as well as Mohiba. Uh, all these are our local partners and we are trying to engage uh, almost 12,000 students across Saudi. So we're really excited about that. And we hope it has a very impactful uh, experience to these kids, as well as most importantly, plant the seed of curiosity and create uh, the generation of uh, youth that will enter STEM and become our engineers of the future. Thank you so much. And we're really excited to hear about the other experiments with us today. And thank you so much, Michelle. I'm now turning it over to Mary Ann Snow with the uh, Yeska Biotech. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. First of all, it's like, Michelle, I agree with you. The experiments sound fabulous, and um, I hope to be able to see some of uh, the work that you're doing. 
My name is Mary Ann Snow. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Escra Biotech. We're a nanomedicine startup based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we're just 18 months old, so we're pretty early in our process. And we're going to space, first of all, because we think that to Jana's point that this is an amazing opportunity to be part of an emerging market which will give us unprecedented opportunities and we also think that in the short term it will help us to accelerate our market entry here on earth. Our technology is a Janus-based nanoparticle or um, JBMP. My co-founder, Dr. Yupong Chen, invented it. He is actually working at the University of Connecticut. Uh, JBMPs, our technology forms an entirely new type of nano delivery platform. It mimics DNA. And um, it, unlike, say, for example, the delivery mechanism that was used for COVID vaccines, which require um, a very low temp storage, it, our uh, platform is, is room temperature stable and um, also time stable. So not only can we keep it at room temperature, eliminating cold chain issues, but we can also keep it for longer periods of time. Um, our delivery system allows for RNA therapeutic delivery, gene editing delivery, or other therapeutics to reach different parts of the, the human body. Very hard to reach parts like joint cartilage. Uh, we can transverse the blood-brain barrier, and we've also had some success with solid tumors. In addition to our delivery platform, the Janus-based nanomaterials can also be self-assembled into a cell-free scaffold that uh, can be used specifically for cartilage repair and regeneration. So between our capacity to um, uh, be delivered into joint cartilage and the scaffold's capability to regenerate cartilage that's been lost, our initial target, uh, our initial target market is arthritis applications, both on the um, uh, disruption of cartilage loss as well as uh, regenerating cartilage that um, has been lost. So utilizing it in those capabilities. And with that, I'm going to take a step back and pass it on to our next uh, person who will be talking about their science. And thank you, Mary. We now have Dr. Clive Spenson with Cedar Sinai. Okay, thanks so much, everybody. How exciting to be here and be part of this amazing team. I'm Clive Spenson. I'm director of the Board of Governors Regenta Medicine Institute at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles. Uh, we're a major medical center with a focus on patient care and cutting edge research. Uh, we also have a GMP manufacturing facility where we can make clinical grade cells for patient trials. So this project's with Axiom and Bioserve and NASA. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's part of the InSpace production program or InSpa. And it's been led by myself and, and a great colleague I have, Dr. Arun Sharma, who some of you might know as well. So he and I planned this out, uh, a lot of help with uh, from Axiom. And the cell we're using is I think one of the most exciting types of cell in, in, in the universe. It's called an induced pluripotent stem cell. And to make these, we first take an adult, uh, any age, uh, and we take a skin cell or a blood cell and we can take it back in time to a pluripotent state or an embryonic state by putting specific genes into these adult cells. So these reprogrammed cells can be expanded indefinitely. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they can then be pushed forward again to make beating cardiomyocytes or heart cells, liver cells, brain cells, in fact, any cell of the human body. And the ability to make these limitless supplies of young cells has obvious uh, opportunities for repairing damaged tissues in humans. And so we're very interested as a hospital to, to do this technology and get it into patients. However, the problem is expanding these cells and making them is not perfect. They naturally want to kind of turn into these differentiated heart cells. So it's uh, very important that we generate very clean IPS lines for the FDA and for manufacturing. And this is where the, the project came in uh, with Jana and her team and Axiom. Uh, so the goal of this mission is to see if we can actually make these IPS cells in zero G. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is test uh, how can we put genes into cells uh, in zero G? And is that more efficient or less efficient uh, than doing that on Earth? It's never been done in zero G, G before. 
And this actually links to gene therapy products in, on earth as well. Gene therapy is putting genes to replace lost genes in, in patients. Uh, we're gonna see if we can do that efficiently. Uh, and so the uh, first part of this uh, project has never been done. But after that, we'd like to actually, the second part and the second mission that we're gonna do is to actually make the iPS cells in space. So once we understand how we can put the genes in, we'll then put the pluripotency genes in on the space station. The astronauts would do this experiment on the space station. And it'll be the first time we've made these magic iPS cells in zero G. And of course, we're very interested to see how they produce up there uh, and see if they're better or worse than on, on Earth. And the hypothesis is, they'll be a little better. Most of what we found about cells growing in space is they grow a little faster uh, and we are predicting they won't differentiate as much. And the final part of this is, even though we might not end up manufacturing cells in space, the iPS cells, we might if it's a, a big benefit, but we'll also learn about what was it about zero G in the genome, in the, uh, the transcriptome of these cells that allowed us to make better iPS cells. So we'll be able to learn that and maybe then do CRISPR editing back on Earth to uh, make the benefit on Earth and use the, the things we discovered in zero G, bring it back to Earth and make better cells on Earth. So finally, we couldn't have done any of this work without the great collaboration partners that we have at NASA, at Bioserve, and of course, Axiom, who've been working tirelessly with our teams uh, to get ready for this exciting launch. And with that, I will hand it back to, to the team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Svensson. I'm now passing it over to Dr. Kat Jamison with the Stanford Stem Cell Institute. Thank you so much, Alexis. It's really a thrill to be here today to be able to talk about our sixth experiment in space since December of 2021, which is hard to believe this time has gone by very quickly. Uh, we're very grateful to Axiom Space for really helping us to understand that space is a unique place to do science, and it's actually an opportunity to accelerate and enable the development of new diagnostics and therapeutic strategies that target precancer and cancer. Um, so I'm here to represent the Sanford Stem Cell Institute Astrobiotechnology Hub that we launched uh, just over a month ago now. And this is the idea to actually work together with the 683 biotech companies here in San Diego to say, can we accelerate the development of products by understanding, as Clive was saying, these unique um, genomic insights that we get in space. So what we've done so far in our integrated space stem cell orbital research center that has been funded by NASA and led by Allison Motri is that hematopoietic or blood forming stem cells age faster. And they actually activate these mutator enzymes Apobex that makes them mutate their DNA. So they start getting precancer, and that is called clonal hematopoiesis. With the experiment that we did last year uh, with Axiom Space, the AX1 mission, we were able to see that cancers, unlike normal stem cells, don't get exhausted. They keep cloning themselves. And that's a major issue, but also a major opportunity for us to see, can we use space to understand why cancer does that? Why does cancer just take off? And so what we started to think about with Janice Studemeyer and the team and my team here with Jessica Pham leading the charge on understanding how cancer clones itself is to say in this low earth orbit environment, can we see if it's a cancer cloning gene that gets turned on almost like liquid oxygen for cancer? So if you watch a launch, you'll see that there's the rocket fuel. The, the rocket is ready to go. It's got rocket fuel, but it's not enough to actually get enough combustion to really take off. That's the liquid oxygen. And this is what we're finding. There's an enzyme called ADAR1 that behaves like the liquid oxygen for cancer. And that's what we're going to do in this mission. We're going to try and turn ADAR1 that cancer cloning gene off using two different drugs that we've found prevent ADAR activation. One is called Fedratinib. It's an FDA approved drug, also known as Enrebic. The other one is called Rebexinib. And then this is a drug that blocks ADAR splicing and its activation. It, the uh, gene ADAR is hugely important, not just because it allows cancer to clone itself, but because it allows cancers to evade the immune system. So with the Axiom team, we're going to determine if cancers proliferate faster. That's going to be in these KCO2 tumor organoid models in a bioreactor that we've developed. And uh, we're going to look at breast cancer models to see if the breast cancer cells that activate ADAR can be shut off and not proliferate. And then we'll look 
look at a leukemia cell type called TF1A with the FUCHI or cell cycle reporter, as well as the ADAR reporter to say when the cells start to clone themselves, do they turn on ADAR? So we'll be doing all of those things uh, with Peggy Woodson, the commander of this mission and the team. We will get real-time images with LIDOS and we'll be able to interpret uh, the data very, very quickly. So we're really trying to turn this around to be able to develop not just therapeutics, but diagnostics to try and predict and prevent cancer recurrence, which is the number one cause of death due to cancer. So for us, we're thrilled to be able to work as part of this team and really be able to understand using microgravity as a strong stressor um, to get these essential insights into how cancer develops, but in 10 days instead of 10 years. So thank you for including us in this mission. Back to you, Alexis. Thank you so much, Kat. I'm now passing it over to Dr. Anthony Atala with the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Thank you so much, Alexis. It's really great to be with everybody today. What an amazing team all around. I mean, I just can't believe all the exciting projects going up in space. So it's really nice to be with all of you. And really what we're actually doing is trying to do these projects where we're bringing regenerative medicine up into space. As you know, the shortage of organs is very real. Every moment, patients are dying who could actually survive if there was an organ available. So Regen Med is actually one of these strategies. We can take tissues and make organs for patients. The strategy involves tissue engineering, where we can take a very small biopsy from the patient. We can expand the cells outside the body, and we can then recreate those cells back into a three-dimensional scaffold by either making them by hand or printing them. So we have many strategies to do that. One of the strategies that we have used is by 3D printing. And we have developed these printers over the last uh, you know, 20 years now, where we basically uh, are able to print cells and scaffolds together using very, very high resolution down to two microns. That's about 1 50th the diameter of one human hair. And we can precisely deposit the cells where they're needed layer by layer and creating bio wings that allow us to bring the cells to these nozzles as a liquid, but once they hit the platform, they retain their integrity. And by doing so, we're able to also create scaffolding systems that act as a highway system, if you will, that is able to bring nutrition to the central portion of the construct, allowing us to create solid structures. And in fact, that was the topic of the vascular tissue challenge that was launched by NASA a few years ago, where the challenge was to actually create solid functional tissue that will remain so for over one year outside the body. And that in itself is a major challenge when you're talking about solid tissues. So this mission is basically the next step for us. How do we take these constructs that we can create with 3D printers and actually make them more robust to actually expand the tissue type for the tissue challenge, we created liver structures. We're now creating both liver and kidney structures. And we're creating these solid structures that we print that we can then send into space and their microgravity conditions that allow us to examine the effects of microgravity on these structures as we construct them and to look at the long-term functionality eventually, but first by looking at the short-term time points that will allow us to see how these cells come together, how they form the tissue together, how they vascularize, helping us to understand some of the basic mechanisms that are needed to bring these technologies back here to Earth, where we can help patients right here in our own planet, but at the same time, able to help our space travelers in the future. We're very excited. Our VTC, our Vascular Tissue Challenge Team, basically included two of our trainees, Kelsey Wilson, who's a graduate student, Youngwoo Kim, a postdoctoral fellow, Sanjeng Lee, a faculty member, Colin Bishop, another faculty member, and my long-term research partner, Dr. James Yu, all of them from the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, bringing together these constructs to send to space under these conditions to study these, uh, the, the long-term effects and the short-term effects initially, and we're very excited to be working hand in hand with Axiom Space and especially Jenna Studemeyer, who has been our partner since the beginning as we move these technologies forward for manufacturing in space, the new frontier. Excited to be with all of you. Thank you.
Great, and thank you so much, Dr. Itala. We will now finally hear from Deva Newman from the MIT Media Lab. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Deva Newman, the Apollo Program Professor of uh, Astronautics here from MIT. And uh, again, just want to uh, reiterate how exciting it is to be part of this crew, part of the scientific crew and technology development for, for the Axiom mission. We are flying what we call the MIT skin suit. It's the gravity loading countermeasure suit, but skin suit for short. And what it does is it loads uh, the astronaut participant from the shoulders down to the feet. It's gonna reload someone with our compression technology suits. This is an incredible opportunity for us to build on our market gravity experience. We're collecting data on an additional astronaut participant with a skin suit. It's primarily a musculoskeletal countermeasure for this mission. And um, we're gonna fly something new, uh, some, a new in-flight protocol with the suit to, to test it out. The study also for the first time gives us an opportunity to put new sensing features into the garment, the suit, and can monitor, we can monitor actually the the material properties, the fabric, the strain, and essentially we're trying to you know, re reload someone. The proposed work has, let's say, two high-level research aims. The first is the technology demonstration itself with this smart suit that we've developed for this, this wonderful opportunity for the AX2 mission. And we'll evaluate and characterize the loading function, we'll assess the comfort of the suit, because this would be, this is to be worn, you know, for a long time in parallel with exercise as, as your exercise countermeasure suit. So technology demonstration first, and then to the science. So the second high level aim then is we're investigating the physiological effects that compression technology that this skin suit can put and specifically musculoskeletal the countermeasure. Um, why? Because we have a significant physiological deconditioning in microgravity. And so our aims then are threefold. The first one is going to uh, assess back, back pain and spinal elongation, kind of recompress, try to get rid of any back pain. The second is looking at the sensory motor function. And then third is since we've now instrumented it, it's an exercise, we'll assess the exercise performance of the astronaut. So we're really excited. It goes on a long uh, legacy of, of of compression suits and skin suit design. This is the uh, our Mark, Mark, Mark 8 version of, of the skin suit. So we're really excited. We can't believe what an opportunity this is uh, to, to fly with all of you, to fly with Axiom. And I want to mention the, the benefits to Earth. Uh, we get very enamored with our, with our space experiments. It's fantastic to have an astronaut subject, but the technology developed and tested for this investigation really has applications for helping people on earth and uh, specifically folks who experience movement dysfunction or loss of muscle mass and strength due to disease or inactivity. So that's really the important goal is again, back down to earth, what our technology and what our space for earth allows us to do. We're super excited about that. Couldn't, uh, couldn't dream of better partners. Um, this is a new day with uh, private space missions. And I've seen it from the academic side, I've seen it from the government side, and now I'm thrilled to you know, see it with uh, the private privatization. I, I wanted to mention one, one other thing quickly on, on the STEAM front, since we're celebrating all of our students and our team, we also get to, to fly what we call the human's disc. What does human stand for? It's humanity united with MIT art and nanotechnology in space. And so it's a record of our voices. So um, our amazing um, students, uh, recorded voices from all over the world, uh, messages of peace and, and love, access across the globe to really, uh, you know, we are democratizing space. It's, it's happening, it's not the future, it's happening now to let everyone have a, have a voice. It's kind of built off the Voyager record. So that's our humans disc, little nanotechnology that we get to fly all from MIT and our MIT in the Media Lab, our space exploration initiative. And a uh, final shout out to all the amazing students, always about the next generation, the next generation of PIs who are making this, this happen. So uh, my name is here, but really I'd have to say that the PI and the skin suit is my wonderful PhD student, um, Rachel Belisle, and on the humans we have um, Maya Nasser, and they have a lot of undergraduates working with them and it, it takes everyone. So wonderful to be with you all and I can't wait for launch. Thank you, Deva, and thank you everyone for the overview of experiments and research for the upcoming AX2 mission. We'll now open the floor to reporter questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please use the raise your hand feature, or you may submit your question to the moderator using the Q&A function. 
To help us keep moving along, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question to. All right, and we'll first um, hear from Jeff Faust. Uh, your line is open, Jeff. Hi, this is Jeff Faust of Space News. A uh, question probably for Dr. Lowe. I'm just curious how this, this collection of um, research payloads came together. I, I suspect some came from the, the Saudi Space Commission, but you also have um, you know, a variety of other payloads. How did you basically aggregate all of these, these research um, experiments together and get them to work together? We have heard from everyone speaking, we have an absolute jam-packed mission. So I know our astronauts are busily, they've been training very hard so that they can perform all of this research. As you say, it's on a fairly short timeline, so we know they're going to be really, really busy. Now, in terms of how these uh, experiments ended up on AX2, then I think we've really highlighted a lot of the partnerships that we've been entering into. So we've, this is the uh, first uh, commercial uh, space flight that, is, uh, into, uh, that, is, that we are joining with a uh, sovereign nation. So the Saudi Space Commission, as you said, they brought a bunch of their own experiments in which Michelle described perfectly and with great enthusiasm. So we're really excited to see what the science is going to come out from that. Um, another one of the partnership aspects was highlighted by Jana and her team and a lot of the PIs on this call who are actually uh, performing research to move towards in-space manufacturing applications. And a number of these projects are actually funded by the NASA in-space uh, manufacturing or INSPA awards. So that is another kind of cohort of projects that was uh, selected to fly on this mission. And then we also have a number of private uh, and uh, commercial customers that want to fly their research in space and so approach us and we discuss with them what their science is, we discuss with them what the feasibility of their projects are, how we might implement it, how we might work with implementation partners to make their, their science and their research uh, visions a success. And then we basically play a massive game of very complicated four-dimensional Jenga where we have not only to fit in all of the research, but we also have to coordinate all the crew time. We work extremely closely with NASA and the ISS National Lab to see how we can try and maximize the time that we have on orbit for our crew to do research experiments. And then we have an incredible team here at Axiom that are incredibly um, experienced with mission integration and operations, who then together with the PIs make all of the magic happen. So it's an incredibly complicated team effort, but uh, we're, we're very positive and excited about some of the research that's going to come out of this mission. Thank you, Lucy. We will now hear from Sophie Sanchez. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Hi, my question is for Michelle. Um, for the short term space tourism based uh, science experiments, are you guys working with any space tourism based companies um, on those studies? And if not, will the data be made available to the public? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, Michelle, I should memory on this side, just in case uh, people uh, didn't hear that. Uh, so I, I just want to clarify. So the idea is not that the data we're trying to collect on the short stay mission is not just for space tourism. It is also trying to understand the effects that microgravity has on the human body, irrespective of whether it's the mission is uh, for space tourism or not. But with the potential for space tourism coming up and a lot of people trying to go to space, it certainly will be beneficial to have this sort of data because a lot of the data that's available generally focuses more on long stay missions. And so we wanted to kind of assess what the short stay missions will have uh, as an effect on the human body and will the human body recover from it following the mission, which is why we do uh, pre-flight, uh, during the flight and post-flight testing to kind of gauge what changes uh, in that timeline. So uh, currently the data is going to be analyzed. Uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, run by uh, Nebula R&D led by uh, Dr. Badr Shira. So as soon as we collect the data, the idea here is that you're contributing to science so therefore the data should will be published. So we hope that we have uh, exciting data to look at and to understand what happens to the human body. Thank you. And thank you so much, Michelle. Um, do any other reporters on the line, um, do you guys have any, any, uh, any questions for the uh, participants? All right, uh, we'll go to Richard Turbo. Line is open. Unmute myself. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. All right. But I'm there. Um, hi. Yeah, Richard Trubu with the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, I wanted to ask the question about comparing to the uh, Axiom One mission, uh, after which the participants really uh, talked about how overwhelmed they were with the schedule. I'm wondering how much of that uh, feedback has been flowed into the Axiom Two mission. If anybody could speak to that, thanks. I can take that if you'd like, Alexis. Sounds good. Thank you, Jana. Or Lucy, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That's a great question. So our AX1 crew uh, worked phenomenally hard on all of the research that they were undertaking for AX1. And you're absolutely right. There were a number of lessons learned from that mission. So those lessons learned have directly flowed into AX2. We've worked incredibly closely with NASA, with the ISS National Lab, and also with our crew as well to help assess what their uh, capabilities are, to also make sure that they are uh, completely trained on every single aspect that they need to be trained on to perform the research that they're doing, and to give them the utmost confidence that they're going to be able to do all of that. So we have the utmost confidence in them. We know that they're going to be doing a fantastic job on orbit, um, and certainly we're very grateful to NASA and our implementation partners and the ISS National Lab for helping to implement some of those lessons learned from AX1. Great, and thank you so much, Lucy. Are there any final questions from the reporters on the line? Yeah, I had a point, Alexis, or just a response to that question as well. This is Katrina Jameson Cat uh, from UC San Diego Sanford Stem Cell Institute. I wanted to mention a lesson learned is that we got a lot of science out of that mission on AX1. And when we shared the science, part of it is on my mission patch behind me, that tumor organoid in the background. The scientists or the astronauts, uh, I call them space scientists, were hugely excited about the results. That's the first time the Keyhance microscope, which is called the Kermit, was used used for imaging any live cells. And we got spectacular images thanks to Michael Lopez Alegria and Tom Marshburn working in lockstep to make sure that we got the images. Um, I've you know shared the data with Axiom and the astronauts and they're very excited about the data that came back and the essential insights we get into how cancer develops and how it comes back and how we target it. So I think we have to think of the astronauts as our constant scientific partners. And we're planted firmly on the ground here, but they are able to provide these essential insights in real time. We got the images in real time with our team working with the Axiom team in Lidos. So I think lesson learned, this is a great place to do science. And when you do spectacular out of this world science, it's going to be time consuming, it's going to be exhausting, but incredibly impactful for the one in three people that will get cancer in their lifetime. We worry that cancer will come back. Well, maybe we'll be part of the solution to prevent that from happening. So I just wanted to say a huge thanks uh, to the astronauts that are taking this opportunity to help us to advance science on Earth by using space to do it. And um, uh, Alexis, I just wanted to add as as probably the newbie of the group, since this will be our first flight, um, AX2 will be our first flight. Janice Stoudemire, um, her team, the Axiom Group, NASA, uh, ISS, as somebody who's just coming into this process, um, extraordinary amount of um, getting us up to speed, but also helping us to be able to get the most out of this time and really um, connecting us with the process so that we can give the crew the lightest load possible while still generating very meaningful results. So when we bring um, our science back, we are able to advance things as fast as possible. Thank you so much for that extra feedback. And it looks like Mike Wall on the line has another question. Um, as, as I mentioned, please state your name, affiliation, and then whom you'd like to direct your question to. Mike Wall, are you on the line? Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, this hi, this this is Mike Wall from space.com. I just had a quick question for Jana. Could could you tell us a little bit more about the in-space manufacturing experiment that you're going to be doing? What what exactly 
like does it consist of what are, what are you hoping to to actually produce and and what do you hope that it might lead to in the in the sort of relatively near future sure thanks so much for the question mike and um pleased to have you on the call with us today so that you could hear directly from some of our partners as well about what they're doing we actually have three in-space manufacturing applications that we're working on precursor, what we call our precursor emissions for. Since the AX2 mission, as you know, is a shorter mission than the commercial resupply missions, which are 30-day missions. In these first, the first precursor experiments, our intent is to look at the basic understanding of the science that we're evaluating in microgravity. So for our DNA nanomaterial therapeutics that Marianne talked about earlier. That's really giving us the first insight into making three, actually three different products on orbit. So we'll be making JBNTs, JBNPs, and JBNMs, which are all different opportunities for us to look at the process of manufacturing in space for products that will either be drug delivery or eventually for osteoarthritis. We'll have subsequent missions for that project that will happen in 2023 and 2024 that will continue to expand out our opportunity to look at both of those products as we manufacture them on orbit. The stem cells that Dr. Clive Spenson talked about from Cedar sinai that's looking at the process early on in the manufacturing of stem cells here on the ground to see if there's advantages in the microgravity environment for that first part of the process. So this precursor helps us to take the first steps at looking at how do we actually put genes or insert the genes that we're gonna need to transform those fibroblasts to iPSC cells in the next missions, which will also happen in 23 and 24. And then as Dr. Anthony Atala talked about, for the Wake Forest project, you know, we're super excited because that takes this next step from what we've done on the ground in the vascular tissue challenge to really looking at the benefits of microgravity as we think about vascularization thick tissue. So we'll do look at both kidney and liver constructs in microgravity as a platform for multiple types of tissue. And then we'll go on in 23 and 24 to look at longer commercial resupply 30 day missions that look at liver and help us to understand more, how do we build a bridge to transplantation until we can get to the opportunities to actually manufacture whole organs, which is the ultimate goal, are there ways that we can look at, you know, build, building blocks that help us to bridge to transplantation for patients? So we're really excited to have these first three precursor missions that are the steps that we will start to take in building those new markets in low Earth orbit that really open up biomedical applications and manufacturing. And having the opportunity to have our research and manufacturing facility, you know, as Clive talked about, there's obviously a need when you're making biomedical products to think about doing that under GMP conditions, just like you would do here on the ground. And so our teams are expert in understanding what it takes to make those products terrestrially. And we're creating those same opportunities and for the first time have the ability to create those in the microgravity environment as well. Thank you. And thank you, Jana. Um, last call for any questions from the reporters online. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. For any follow-up questions or to set up an interview with our team or PIs, you can send them to me or mediaaxiomspace.com. We will ensure your requests get to the right person. You can follow updates on AX2 Research on our website at axiomspace.com and on social media via the hashtag AX2. Thank you again for your time and go AX2. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you.